Welcome to Southgate. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, if you are joining in with us today that you are connected with a local church. Uh, we hope and we pray that if you're in the North Grenville area that you are connected to Southgate in a physical way that you are coming out to services and you are joining in on the events that are happening in person. And if you're wondering how you can get connected to some of those things, uh, we would just say that you could sign up for the email uh, that uh, goes out weekly as well. You can follow us on our socials and uh, check in on the website to see what is going on in person and in our community. And so uh, we want you to be connected in that way. And uh, if you want to participate in what we are doing by giving financially, that will be up on the screen. We hope and we pray that this service is a benefit to you and your walk with Jesus. Good morning, Southgate. I'm Pastor Kevin, and uh, if you uh, if you're new to uh, Southgate, if you're just joining us for the first time today, and uh, you decided to join us because you had heard that the preaching here was excellent, I want to tell you that you have heard truthfully. Uh, ben, however, is away this week, and you're stuck with me. Um, so, uh, just a little self-deprecating humor to get things started off here. Um, uh, Pastor Ben, our, our regular preacher, teacher, uh, is away for a couple of weeks. And so, uh, he actually gave me the opportunity to uh, come up with a series. And uh, so, I'm very, very excited about sharing this with you. Uh, so, the series is going to be called King Jesus. And we are going to be talking about the gospel over the next four weeks. And uh, uh, this is something that, that, that really excites me. And when something really excites you, you should want to talk about it. Uh, sometimes people think that it's weird to talk about the gospel or their faith. But if it's something that excites you, that's what we as people do. We talk about the things that excite us. For example, um, I really love this movie, Tenet. Um, it is It has slowly become one of my favorite movies of potentially all time. And I, I'm so excited about this movie and there's so many things to talk about that I just want to share it with everyone. I've probably annoyed a few of you with my love for Tenet. And so... Um, it's something that uh, I remember I texted a good friend of mine and I said, have you seen Tenet? We need to talk about it because I've got some theological exposition that I want to do of it. And that those are the kind of nerdy conversations that I have with my friends. And so um, I, I said, we've got to talk about Tenet. And he's like, what's Tenet? And I was just like, oh my goodness, you have not heard of Tenet? Well, what you need to do is you need to clock out right now, tell your boss that you have something very important to do because you wouldn't be lying to him. You'd be telling him the truth. You've got to go home and you've got to watch Tenet. Be prepared to have your mind blown. And... Uh, and he, he, he went, went about, you know, a couple of days and I reminded him, I said, have you seen Tenet yet? That's your homework. That's, that's your assignment. And he's like, no, I, I haven't watched it yet. I've been doing like important things like going to the gym, um, you know, being a part of uh, my church family and all of this stuff. And I said, priorities here. Okay, priorities. You need to watch Tenet and we need to talk about it. And obviously I'm joking, he's a much better person than I am, uh, but eventually uh, he, he gets onto Netflix, he looks for Tenet and he says, I can't find it anywhere. And I, I tell him he's been spelling it wrong. And then, he, you know, we come back and, and we talk about it again. And he's like, I, I just haven't seen a TV show in a really long time. I'm like, it's a movie, man. It's Christopher Nolan. And he's like, who's Christopher Nolan? <sighs> And I, I'm going through and I'm, I'm just building this whole thing up. And finally, my friend watches Tenet and he goes, yeah, it was crazy. I don't know if I get it. <laughs> like, 
there was times where like all of a sudden the audio was like super loud. The soundtrack was going so loud. I couldn't hear some of the dialogue that was going on. And I'm like, but, but you got to understand that's part of the experience. That's what, what Christopher Nolan does. He, he makes, he makes these really loud soundtracks so that you feel the movie so that your first experience is just this feeling. And then you go back and you watch it again and you talk about it with your friends if they'll do it with you. <laughs> and, and so I was just so excited to talk about this. Not only was I excited to talk about it, but I was excited to defend it. I was excited to talk about all the misconceptions that my friend might have had during his first movie watching experience. And so we ended up talking about it for a very long time. And, uh, and, and, and I just want to say that as excited as I am about Tenet, I am also excited about the gospel and I'm, I'm very passionate about the gospel and not only am I passionate about talking about the gospel but I am passionate about defending the gospel and hearing out the misconceptions that people have about what it is and what it means for us and so I want to today and for the next four weeks unpack what the gospel is what it isn't and why it's important, because this is the kind of thing that excites me. And I, I believe that as Christians, this is foundational for us. This is the thing that should get us all excited. But unfortunately, what often happens, and I've said this before, uh, um, I believe that the gospel gets misunderstood. There are many things that often when people think they're presenting the gospel, there are many things left unexplained. In an attempt to make the gospel accessible, we have stripped it of many of its elements. And in many ways, we've left it open to misinterpretation and distortion. So this is, this is a completely understandable thing, though. Sometimes we don't have hours upon hours to expand on what the gospel is, what it isn't, what it means for you. Sometimes we just don't have that. And, and, and to be honest, even as I prepared for this series, I found myself saying, I just don't have enough time. I can't forget this. I can't forget this thing. I can't forget that. And... and and we do, we, we make efforts to engage with the full gospel as often as we can because it is light and life to those who believe. And so we do our best to make these efforts happen. And so I want to say that even as I critique some of this gospel uh, misinterpretations and, uh, and distortions that are out there, please understand I probably still won't have enough time to give you everything. And so uh, there are some great resources out there that I, that I have found helpful as I've been preparing for this series. And so I'd like to give them to you. Number one is a book called Simply Good News by N.T. Wright. Uh, the next one would be uh, a lot of where we got the title of this series from. It's called The King Jesus Gospel by Scott McKnight. And then lastly, one of my favorite resources that I often give give to you guys is the Bible Project. I really believe that, that what they are doing is extremely gospel-centered. They're showing how the entire Bible is leading up to building into uh, the gospel message. And so um, I, 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 I would love for you, if you are enjoying this series, to take in some of these resources, and I'll probably talk about them again. Um, but those are some things that I would love for you to engage with on top of this series. And so as we talk about the gospel, and, and I've already kind of hinted at this idea that there are some distortions out there. There are, uh, there are ways in which we present the gospel that are easily misunderstood because we have potentially brought it down to a much too simple, uh, simplistic 
version of it. And so uh, I'm going to begin by talking about this one. You, you've probably seen something like this before. Um, and, and often I, I, think, I think what's kind of funny about this is that, you know, it seems like somebody would say, like, I don't know if I can buy into this gospel that you speak of. You know, it, it seems very complicated. It seems like it would take a lot of time to, uh, to, to, to actually get what this gospel is saying. And then the Christian response is like, no, 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 it's actually really childish. Come, have a look. Let me grab my uh, felt board here and I'll show you how simple it really is. And the reality is the gospel is, is far more complicated uh, than, than just a few conversations can really unpack. And so we've often kind of boiled it down to something like this. See, uh, the gospel means good news. And that's, that's true. The gospel, that word, it means good news. Um, and, uh, and so we say the good news is that you're really bad. You're really bad. That's the good news. The good news is that you're really bad and, um, and, and God is really good and we want to get over to God, uh, but we can't do that because there's this chasm in between. Um, and so uh, we try to fill it with other things. Um, we try to fill it with religion, good works, morality, philosophy, but none of those things can truly fill it in. And then finally, we get to uh, the last portion of this, which would be that Jesus comes in, he fills in the gap, and we can come over and we can be with God. And don't get me wrong, there are elements of this that are very true and very important, and there are elements of this that... That, that really are good news. But this, this is, this is actually not the gospel. This is not what Paul has in mind when he talks about the gospel. This is not what the gospels in the Bible themselves are saying. This has some of it, but it is missing a large amount. And ultimately, one of the biggest problems with giving the gospel presentation this way is it becomes very human centric. It becomes centered around the individual. It's all about you and what you can get. And the reality is the gospel is so much bigger. It is so much better. It is so much more important. It is so much more encompassing of everything and we miss out on that when we just give this individualistic, here's what you can get out of it. Now, don't get me wrong. There are things that you as an individual are going to benefit from the gospel. But again, it is far, far bigger than that. So this image, this, this image that we often see as representative of the gospel, it's not necessarily unbiblical in and of itself. It's largely based off of the passage Romans 6.23, which tells us that for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so... This is kind of where some people have built their theology of the gospel around. And uh, once again, this is, this is an important thing. This is something that Paul thought was important enough to include in one of his letters, in particular this letter to the Romans. But notice that Paul does not call this the gospel. Paul does not say, well, the gospel is for the wages of sin is death. That's not what he says. In fact, Paul gives us a, a better clue as to what the gospel is in his mind when he opens his letter to the Romans. He says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and in the holy scriptures regarding his son who, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David, and who, through the spirit of holiness, was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And this is, a, this is an important phrase, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is very similar to saying Jesus Christ, our King. 
Through him, we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. Now, what we see here is something that you will see in common every time Paul goes on to describe what the gospel is. And it's a connection to scripture. Notice that that what Paul says is that the gospel is something that is according to scripture. And, And here's the thing that we need to understand as well. Paul's letters were written before the four gospels that we see in our Bible. So when he talks about according to scripture, he is not talking about the four gospels that we have. He's actually talking about the Old Testament, what we would call the Old Testament. And so when Paul says something like this, he's talking about a gospel that was already promised in scriptures. And he's therefore saying that what was promised, the the whole thing beforehand is important. If we're going to understand the gospel, we have to understand the setup for the gospel. And so as we take some time in this series to go through what the gospel actually is, today I would like to talk to us about that setup. What is this setup? What what does he mean when he says, according to the scriptures? And next week we will talk about that a little bit more as well. And so uh, just to just to kind of take this this point and and make it even further, take a look at First Corinthians fifteen, which says, "Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved." If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, so now he's going to talk about what it is that he received, this gospel that he presented to them. What I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. See, what, what, what Paul is trying to get here is that there is a connection between this gospel of Jesus, the life of Jesus, and the Old Testament. And often we don't include that when we talk about the, the, the good news or the gospel. He's pointing to the same truth that Jesus points to when Matthew records, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come, uh, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus is saying, I'm taking the story that began in the Old Testament and I am bringing it to completion. And and, and that in and of itself is the good news. It's that Jesus completes what was beginning in the Old Testament. But if we don't know what was happening in the Old Testament, we don't get a full picture of what the gospel really is. And so... We're going to take some time to talk about that story. And that story, of course, it it begins in Genesis 1. And this is something that we have talked about before, but I believe that it is worth repeating. But the story begins in Genesis 1 with God creating a good world, a world teeming with life and beauty. When we look at the creation narrative, and and this is something that I've, I've talked about before in previous sermons as well, we need to be careful not to view it as a just so story. Uh, this is not a how did this get made kind of version of creation. If we do this, we miss out on its true meaning. We are introduced to the character of God, who we are told 
He tames the chaos. That's this idea of, of the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. Waters often represented chaos in the Old Testament. And so what God does is he tames this chaos and he tames the chaotic waters of the uncreated world and forms life by assigning tasks and giving purpose. This is, this is what God is doing in that creation story. You'll see often that he is separating things and then he is naming them. And what that denotes, what that shows us is that God is assigning roles and purpose to all of creation. That, that ultimately what God is doing is he is assigning people what, he's assigning creation what their role will be after uh, the, this whole narrative is done. And this is why in the creation narrative, um, we, we see this, this idea of God separating things and naming things. And this all leads up to day six and day seven, where God installs image bearers or representatives to rule and reign over his creation on his behalf. And day seven is where God rests. And so these are two important components and things that the Bible will constantly be going back to, constantly be looking to as the beginning of this story. See, there's a lot of significance to this idea of rest. There's, there's a whole bunch of different things that we could talk about, but we're going to focus in on one aspect today. And that is that rest in the ancient world for a deity meant to take up residence. That, that this was going to be the place where they would rest. Think of it like uh, we don't have all the pomp and circumstance of, of uh, inauguration day like they do in uh, the U.S., but think of it as something similar to that. It's this idea that, um, that the president is, is moving into the White House, that, that that is where they are going to take up their rule and reign of the country. And this is the same kind of idea that we see in Genesis. God is going to take up his rest in all of creation, that he is going to reside with his creation and rule over it. Now, typically, these, these deities, they would, they would rest within a temple. But one of the things that we find in the, in the Christian, the Judeo-Christian narrative is that God doesn't reside in a temple. He actually takes up his rest in all of creation. That, that meant that he didn't have just a specific geographical location. It meant that the whole world was his, that all of creation was where he was going to be ruling and reigning. And so th this idea of like a temple, it's going to come, it's going to come back in in the future. So this idea that, that there's a geographical location where, where God rules and reigns, that's going to come back into the story. But what we're focusing on is the, the original creation that God was taking up his rule and reign in all of creation. And so this creation, this creation story sets the stage for the gospel. God has created a good world. He intends on ruling this good world. But how does he intend on doing that? Well, he intends on doing it through his image bearers. We see in Genesis 2 that Adam is given an assignment. What is his assignment? He's to name the creatures. Something that God was doing in Genesis 1. And so what is happening is God is saying, I want you to take over. I want you to be a part of this ruling and reigning, but I want you to do it as I would. You are my representative. And we saw earlier that this role of God uh, that he was fulfilling before, it's this task of, uh, that, that is given to humans and ultimately they are to rule and reign as he would. So how, how are we supposed to do that? How, how are we as humans supposed to rule and reign as God would? Well, think about it this way. 
we've been programmed. We've been created with programming. Uh, we know this from, from studying the human body. We know this from studying DNA. We have been programmed. We have been designed. Or as we said earlier, we have a purpose to rule, but as images. That means we will not rule on our own. And this is one of the, one of the greatest pieces of self-deception that we have of ourselves. That we are independent. We're not taking our cues from anything but our own heart. We're just following our heart. And this is why I love, there's, there's a scene in, in the very first Avengers movie where Loki goes on a monologue about humans. And here's what he says about humans. He says, is this not simpler? Is this not your natural state? He's, he's commanded everyone to kneel down before him. It's the unspoken truth of humanity that you crave subjugation. The bright lure of freedom diminishes your life's joy in a mad scramble for power and identity. You were made to be ruled, and in the end, you will always kneel. And one German man steps up and he says, not to men like you. And, and this, is, this is the kind of profound statement that, it, that is made in this. Somebody doesn't step up and they say, no, we rule our own lives. No, nobody, nobody says that. There's, there's no objection to the nature of humanity here. We will kneel. We will worship. That is what we were designed to do. We were designed to worship before God and then rule and reign over the creation that he has given us. This is what it means to be an image bearer, to worship the one that we image. So the question is not, will we worship? The question is not, will we kneel? It's, what will we worship? What will we kneel down to? Do we worship the God of comfort, success, excess, sex, power, fame, influence? Who do we worship? And this will absolutely change how we work out our role as ruling and reigning over the rest of creation. Think about it in terms of like a, an assembly line. We have been designed to receive input. We've been designed to receive input from that which we worship. And there, uh, and there all sorts of processes that, that go in uh, through our minds and hearts. Uh, but ultimately, that input will affect the final product. It will affect what our output is. And so if something in that assembly line uh, that was, something comes into that assembly line that was never meant to be there, the outlook is not, or the output is not going to look right. Not only that, it's going to destroy the assembly line itself. Maybe not right away, but certainly over time, because that's not the input that the assembly line was created to receive. And this is, this is the way that, that sin and idolatry work. That, that ultimately, when we choose to worship other gods, we are taking improper input. It's going through the assembly line of our lives, and it's destroying the assembly line, but it's also making these devastating outcomes. And this would be our sinful behavior. And that's why I would say that the, the, the problem that the gospel actually addresses is a much bigger problem than sin itself. Sin is actually the product. The problem is idolatry. We have chosen to take our cues from other things, from other gods. And the product is always going to be sin, pain, and death. Part of the problem that the Bible is setting up here is that we have chosen, much like the first humans, to receive the wrong input. Therefore, it's not just my individual life that is broken. 
And it doesn't just affect me. It is not about me getting a ticket into heaven. It is about righting all the wrongs that have been done through me. It affects all of creation. Other people, plants, hum- uh, animals. It affects all of it. And if you don't believe me, if you don't believe that this effect is much bigger than just you and your sin, listen to Paul's words to the Romans again. This is found in Romans 8, 19 to 21. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. Who is creation subject to? Who was given the responsibility of stewarding creation? Who is Paul talking about? He is talking about humans in hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory of the children of God. See, the gospel, and this is what Paul is talking about here, is the effects of the gospel. They are felt not just by us. He later goes on to talk about how all of creation is groaning. All of creation, and and that same kind of groaning word is what we talk about when we talk about the Israelites crying out to God going, please save us. That's the same kind of thing that all of creation is doing before God. They are saying, please, please save us from these people. Please, can they get it right? They're watching with anticipation. All of creation is watching us, wanting us to get back on track. The gospel message is so much bigger than just me and my afterlife. The gospel message is about all of creation. So what this means is that this story, this story is lacking. It's lacking so much just in terms of the problem. And therefore, it's missing out on a lot in terms of the solution. The problem is that God wishes to rule over the world, but he wishes to do it through humans, and he hasn't given up on that plan. But we have refused to play our part, and it affects more than just us as individuals. All of creation is groaning, hoping that we would figure this out. The gospel is the answer to this problem. Problem. The good news is that through Jesus Christ, God is restoring his image, reclaiming his throne, and teaching us the way and atoning for our mistakes. And I hope that as we go through this series, we are able to rediscover this, find hope not just for ourselves, but for our neighbors for our families, for our schools, for our workplace, for our community. Because I truly believe that the good news is even better than we can imagine right now. And so as we, as we kind of sit in this for a week, there's a couple of next steps that I would like to take us through. Number one being this, What are the things that we have put in the place of God in our lives? We've been asking this question quite a bit as we've gone through the book of Habakkuk. And and, and the, the topic of idols has come up quite a bit. But we need to be asking this question because I really do believe that this is a core problem. And we ignore it. We'd like to make it about sin behavior But that sin behavior is a symptom of the things that we worship. What dominates your schedule? Where do you spend your money? What takes control of your thoughts? These are what we would call idols. And these are the things that we need to get rid of and replace with worship of God. Number two, 
Are there ways that I have focused the gospel around myself? Although the gospel has personal implications, don't get me wrong, there are things about the gospel that are going to be personally beneficial, but those are the result. That is not necessarily the purpose. It's bigger than just me. Think about it. If we reduce the gospel to just a story about me and God, then it's no wonder we don't want to share it with anyone. When we realize that the gospel is about the restoration of all creation, there is a desire to see all of it transformed. Can you imagine if not just the, the people around you are being transformed, but literally, literally the geographical space around you was being transformed because we were living as good stewards the way that God had created us to be. What an incredible community that would become. I want to encourage us, let's stop thinking about the individualistic gospel. And let's remember that the gospel, though it has some wonderful and beautiful things to say for us as individuals, let's not focus so much on that because there is so much more. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you. I thank you for your gospel. I thank you that it is something that can't be easily grasped in one sermon because it is something far greater and something far bigger than one sermon. I thank you, God, that, that, that you have created the world to work in such a way uh, that, that when things are happening properly, when, when we are worshiping properly, things go according to plan. You have created a wonderful and good world. And I pray, God, that we would see how our worship of other things has caused us to deviate, has caused us to allow sin to enter the world, death and decay. God, I pray I pray that we would be people who long for restoration, long for restoration, not just of ourselves, but of, of our communities, of the planet, of, of the other creatures that you have created. God, I pray, I pray that this would be our heart, that we would see that the gospel is so much bigger, so much greater, and that ultimately, we need to make you king over all of our lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.